So I have um, 45 minutes to talk about the nature of existence starting now, which reminds me, this is my question, what is existence? This is what I'm going to tell you about um, today. Um, it reminds me of uh, something that some of you may be old enough to remember, which is um, the Monty Python All England Summarised Proust competition, <laughs> where people were invited to summarize Proust in uh, five minutes. Um, so I'm going to talk about the nature of existence for uh, approximately 45 minutes. And thanks very much to the forum and to Danielle um, for the invitation to talk about this. Um, the question, of course, the nature of existence, I, I um, gave this title in order to pull in the crowds, which it obviously has done and disappointed most of them. Uh, the question is one which has many interpretations. It, there are many questions that uh, are covered by those words, and I, I'm sorry if I'm going to disappoint you, but I did give an abstract of what I'm exactly I'm going to talk about. I'm not going to talk about the thing that the great uh, explorer, warrior, and poet of the 16th century, Sir Walter Raleigh, did in his poem, What is Our Life? Um, I don't know if you know this, this beautiful little poem that he wrote, um, with this beautiful line that the graves which hide us from the scorching sun are like drawn curtains when the play is done. Now, that's a, the question there he's addressing is what is our life? What is it for us to exist in the particular way that we do? Uh, and this was also a question addressed by Heidegger, whose central question of his work, Being in Time, is what he called the question of being, which is the question of our being, the nature of our being. And he had a particular answer to that question, which was that the nature of our being is that we are those beings for whom our own being is a question. In other words, we're the only ones who ask these kind of questions. We're the only beings in the world that ask those kinds of questions about the nature of being uh, and the nature of our own being. Um, now, so those are very important and central philosophical questions um, which I probably couldn't answer in 45 minutes. Um, there's another question too which may, I'm sure, have uh, occurred to you at uh, many times in your life, which is not the question of what is the nature of our being, which assumes that we have being, but it's the question of which things have being or which things exist. Um, now, in some cases, this is, these questions seem to be um, abstract questions or theoretical questions, or in the words of the great... Uh, English football commentator David Coleman, the question is academic, if not totally irrelevant. <laughs> um, if philosophers talk about, for example, the existence of numbers, and this is a very important and central <coughs> and ancient philosophical question, what is mathematical reality? What is it for uh, n claims about numbers to be true? What needs to exist in order for claims about numbers to be true? Many people aren't interested in those kinds of questions, but many people are interested in the question uh, to which an answer is presupposed in this famous picture, in the question of the existence of God. Um, now, that's another question, and I'm starting off this lecture in the way people often do, by saying what I'm not going to talk about. I'm not going to talk about the nature of our being, and I'm not going to talk about what exists. Um, so... You can leave now if you want. There may be some people outside who could take your place. Uh, I'm going to talk about a question which is in some ways more tractable and some ways one which is presupposed by uh, some of these questions. And it's something that I've um, written about in a, uh, a little book that I've just um, published um, called The Objects of Thought. That's the question of what is it to exist. So I want to distinguish the question of what is the nature of our existence or our being, um, what exists, which things exist, uh, and there's another question which is how do we know which things exist. But I'm distinguishing those from today's question which is what is it to exist. Um, 
And by that, I mean the same as what is it to be. So I talked about being. You know, Heidegger talked about the question of being. Um, I talked about the nature of being, the nature of our being, and the nature of, um, uh, or, well, which things have being or which things e exist. And so I'm just using those words, being and existence, to mean the same thing. Now, of course, many philosophers have distinguished between being and existence, including some of the ones I'm going to talk about tonight. It won't actually be relevant to anything I'm going to say, but if anyone wants to ask about the difference between being and existence, then we can talk about it in discussion. There'll be some time for questions um, at the end of this talk. Now, some philosophical answers in recent years to the questions of what is it to exist, or what does it mean to exist, or what is it to be, um, rather predictable ones, to exist or to be is to occupy space and time. To exist is to be physical, um, so that everything is physical, everything which has existence has some physical nature. And then there's this famous slogan coming from the American philosopher Quine, who said that to exist is to be the value of a variable. To be is to be the value of a variable. Um, and if you don't know what that means, then I recommend you keep it that way. <laughs> Your life will not be enhanced by knowing what that means if you don't know what it means already. Um, and I can explain that in discussion too if anyone uh, has the temerity to disagree with me on this point. Uh, then, of course, you get philosophers who say there's nothing informative to be said about this question, or the, the question is meaningless, or the question cannot be addressed, or the question rests on a mistake. Um, or the question rests on a confusion. And there are those philosophers who use the word confusion when they mean mistake. Um, and you'll know who they are. Uh, now, I'm, I don't think this question rests on a mistake, and I don't think it rests on any confusion. I'm going to um, tell you what the question means and how to answer it. Um, and the way I'm going to do that is that I'm going to think about what existence is uh, I'm not going to give you any sort of theory of existence or something like that, but I'm going to tell you some things about existence, and I'm going to address that by cross contrasting it with non-existence. In particular, what I'm going to do is to talk about what existing things are by contrasting them with non-existing things. And I'm not going to accept any of the answers given above, that to exist is to be in space and time, to exist is to be physical, or to be is to be the value of a variable, or things like that. Um, I'm going to contrast the existing with the non-existing and see what we can say in the most general or abstract terms about that distinction. However, some people might immediately get concerned about this by, well, if you think that uh, there's actually something rather strange about the idea of a non-existing thing. What does it mean to talk about non-existing things? One dogma of contemporary philosophy is that the idea of a thing that does not exist is somehow contradictory. Um, to say that some, because the idea of a thing is just the idea of something that exists. So things are what exist. If you ask, well, what, what exists in the world, you might start off in a sort of modest way by saying, well, things, or stuff. Uh, and they say, well, which things exist? Uh, and then you start giving your particular theory of what, of what is in the world. Um, but, but these people say, by assuming the idea of the thing, you're assuming something like the idea of existence. So talking about things that don't exist is talking about, in effect, existing things that don't exist. And that's a bit like talking about red things that are not red. That's something that seems to be something contradictory. Um, now, for those of you who know what to be is to be at the value of a variable means, that, that's basically the idea behind um, this um, criticism. Um, the, the dogma of contemporary philosophy comes from American philosophy of language of the mid-20th century that says that the idea of the thing or the idea of something goes with the idea of existence. So it's just a confusion or a contradiction to say that there are things that don't exist, for example. 
or to say some things don't exist uh, or to talk even about things that don't exist is a kind of um, confusion um, now you might have been tempted by that line of thought nonetheless the fact is that we do talk about things that don't exist all the time um, not just in philosophy um, but you know, in ordinary life there's unicorns unicorns don't exist there aren't any unicorns um, we tell our children things about stories about things that don't exist Santa Claus doesn't exist and at some point you tell them Santa Claus doesn't exist or they find out from some mean person at school that Santa Claus doesn't <coughs> exist that's a discovery for them they thought Santa Claus existed maybe and then they discover that he didn't um, it, when I was preparing for this lecture I, I did um, that, some research um, which of course uh, involves that remarkable invention Google these days research on Googling are the same thing um, and I discovered that uh, the, the learned publication USA Today on the 17th of October which is my birthday 2006 published a list of the 101 most influential people that never lived <laughs> uh, here are some of them it's a very interesting list actually and it is a bit, little bit of course they're talking about people who never lived rather than people who never existed um, and that might be a different thing of course not everything that exists lives but maybe everything that lives exists um, it's a little bit confusing the Marlboro Man of course is a character in, a, in an advert for cigarettes um, and in fact the Marlboro Man died and uh, on my view you can't die unless you once lived right? uh, but when people say the Marlboro Man died what they mean is um, the actor who played the who was the model in the, in the photographs he was the one his name was Wayne McLaren I think he died the Mar it's interesting the Marlboro Man is the most influential person that, ne that never lived according to um, USA Today Big Brother of course King Arthur Santa Claus um, and here's an interesting phenomenon which would be worth talking about which is two names for the same non-existing thing which is a very interesting puzzle about when you have when you can say you've got the same non-existing thing if it's not something real um, their counting is a bit odd as well because they have Romeo and Juliet as number eight and they have two people <laughs> number nine <laughs> nonetheless you can, the, the pervasiveness of talk about the non-existent is um, a fact which is so obvious that to somehow banish this talk and say that underneath when you say many things we talk about don't exist or many uh, characters in Greek mythology didn't exist maybe all of them um, or some people like to say that you know some characters in the Bible existed and some didn't As a, this is my view I think Jesus existed I think um, King Solomon I think probably existed I think probably Moses didn't exist Abraham didn't exist so that's my attitude to the, the Bible so I can say some people in the Bible existed and some didn't well there I am I'm talking about the ones that didn't so talk about things that don't exist is a pervasive feature of our talk and thought about the world there are many distinctions and subtleties and, uh, that you can uh, make or draw in uh, talking about these things I want to draw a broad distinction which is very important to me um, between one kind of thing that doesn't exist fictional characters by which I don't mean Mr. Cumberbatch I mean the character Sherlock Holmes um, so I think Sherlock Holmes doesn't exist you may disagree with me about that and that's fine and we can debate that but I think that the Sherlock Holmes is, is a character a fictional character who doesn't exist by a fictional character I mean a character talked about in a fiction so some characters talked about in fiction exist and some didn't Napoleon for example was a character in War and Peace um, Napoleon existed um, so I'm talking about fictional characters who don't exist like Sherlock Holmes for example um, now if you're skeptical you might think Sherlock Holmes is in some ways real or existing or has some sort of being 
and then we can come back to that. But this is the distinction I make at the moment is fictional characters that don't exist, where it's normally taken to be a proper understanding of the fiction that you know they don't exist. You don't think they're part of the real world. It's normally part of the proper understanding of the fiction. To, to properly grasp the fiction, um, you need to have accepted that they don't exist. Um, and I want to distinguish that from, from another kind of um, non-existent thing, non-existent object, uh, which is when you're mistaken about what exists. So if you're an atheist, you think that the theist, the believer, is mistaken about whether God exists. Um, and you know, if you're right, they are mistaken. This is a representation of the planet Vulcan, uh, which doesn't exist. <coughs> planet Vulcan is, was um, a planet which was hypothesized or postulated by the French astronomer Urbain Le Verrier, uh, who in 1859 he proposed that there was a planet between Mercury and the Sun. Um, and he used, the methods he used to do that were the same methods that he'd used to uh, hypothesize the planet Neptune about 10 years earlier. So with Neptune, he obviously thought he was onto a winner because then they found Neptune. Neptune does exist. It's out there. Uh, and he tried it again with um, Mercury to explain... Sorry, with uh, Vulcan to explain... Uh, some perturbation in the orbit of Mercury, which was unexplained by Newton's cosmology. And he said there must be a planet out there between Mercury and the Sun. But it doesn't exist. There's no such thing. So Leverian made a mistake. He was in error because there is no such planet. Uh, and that's another kind of case. So that's different from Sherlock Holmes. No one's saying that uh, Conan Doyle made an error in saying there was Sherlock Holmes because everyone knew what he was doing. So I want to make that distinction between error and, and fiction. Um, and in general, I want to say similar kinds of things about both cases. <coughs> I will say different things about them too, but in the general, for the point of this lecture, I want to say we can say the same thing about cases of error and cases of fiction. Um, so, I say, and I've convinced you, I know, that we do talk about things that don't exist. Um, are we just talking nonsense? It's the idea of a thing that doesn't exist somehow contradictory or deeply confused. I want to say no. But then I have to say, I, but I have to then say to you, what are things that don't exist? What do I mean by this? Um, a further question, which I'll come to right at the end of the lecture, is why it matters to understand the idea of things that don't exist. And I'll only... I'll only really address that at the end of my, my lecture. Um, and when I say what are things that don't exist, part of that question is, can be understood as what properties they have. And by properties, I mean what, people, what philosophers also call attributes or qualities or the features of things. I'm not distinguishing between the uses of any of those words. So the properties of things are things like the, the, sh the shape of something, its colour, its mass or its weight, its density, um, all these things which are properties of people. If a person is attractive, that's a property of them. If a person is uh, standing in a certain relation to another person, like it's being a cousin of some person, then that's a property too, or a relation, sometimes called a relation, sometimes called a relational property. So all these things which are the features of things as opposed to things themselves are what we call, in, in metaphysics, what we call properties. So another way to put it is that the properties of things, or the properties things have, are the things, are things that are true of them. I shouldn't have said things twice there. What's true of things, what's true of the objects we talk about, those are the properties of things. So if you say Le Verrier is French, I said that a minute ago, that's true. Um, uh, uh, Arthur Conan Doyle was an author, that's a property of him. You know. And then, you know, the table is brown, right? Because you have to, in every philosophy lecture, you have to mention the table. There's always a problem with the table somewhere, for some reason. Um, um, that's what it's all about, somehow. It's all about tables. Um, 
so this is what I mean by property. So when I say what are non-existent objects, you know, I want, part of that question is asking well, what kind of properties do they have? Because if you say what are um, insects, you say, well, are there are these beings somewhere in the sort of phylogenetic tree that have these kind of, um, they have six legs or eight legs, I can't remember now. Six. They have a certain kind of body, they have certain kind of features. You describe things by describing their features. Um, and that's the idea of a property is then going to be important. Property or a feature or a quality or an attribute, all these words have been used in different ways. I'm using them all in the same way for simplicity because nothing depends on it. And what I want to do is to contrast two distinct conceptions of things that don't exist, which are associated by two um, old bearded figures from the history of philosophy. Um, Descartes on, on the left and the Austrian philosopher Meinong um, on the right. Um, now, they had very different conceptions of uh, things that don't exist or non existent objects. Um, and I'm going to describe those, and I'm going to say how ni neither of them is right. Each of them got a little bit right, but um, neither of them got it ho the whole thing right. The Descartes, or the Descartes-Malebranche view, I say, because Malebranche, Descartes, um, the philosopher who followed Descartes uh, in some ways, had this phrase, nothingness has no properties. In other words, nothing. So if non-existence, non-being, is really literally nothing, then nothing can be true of it. It can't have any properties. It's just nothing. Um, So, this is, this is what I'm calling the Descartes-Malebranche view. Um, as it happens, their view is much more sophisticated than this, so I'm just, this is, I'm, I'm pinning this slogan on, their, on, on, on them because of this nice phrase, nothingness has no properties. So on this view, if Sherlock Holmes really is a non-existent object, then he has no properties at all. Um, he, well, we don't even know what we mean by he, What's, what does a he refer to there? So. If Pegasus, the winged horse of Greek mythology, is really not a non-existent object, then it's nothing. It has no properties. This raises the question, then, of how we distinguish between Pegasus and Sherlock Holmes, if neither of them have any properties by which we distinguish them. Normally, we distinguish things by their properties. We say, you know, people are distinguished by their facial appearance, or their height, or their weight, or their DNA, or their fingerprint or something like this. These are all properties of things by which we distinguish them. But it seems that if literally, literally true that Sherlock Holmes is nothing and has no properties, then uh, not, and Pegasus also has no properties, Vulcan has no properties, then how do we actually distinguish these things? It seems that, now that seems to be a rather confused thought. So that's the Descartes-Malebranche view. On the other hand, there's um, Meinong's view. Um, and Meinong's view is that non-existent objects have all the properties attributed to them. So, in other words, if I'm talking about Sherlock Holmes and I say, you know, Sherlock Holmes lived in Baker Street, Sherlock Holmes was a detective, and you say Sherlock Holmes smoked a pipe, Sherlock Holmes took cocaine, he played the violin, you know, and you're attributing all these properties to Sherlock Holmes. He's just got them just because we're attributing them. It's a non-existent object has the properties attributed to them. Um, <coughs> now, um, I should say for those who know a little bit about this, that Meinon distinguished mm -hmm. between objects that exist and objects that have being. Uh, Meinong thought that only spatio-temporal things exist. So he's one of those people who held one of the views I mentioned. That existence, it particularly, is the mode of being which spatio-temporal things have. Um, and there are things which have different modes of being, things which have existence, which have being rather outside of space and time. And he he, he called that mode of being subsistence. But outside existence and subsistence, he also thought there were things that had no being at all. And 
So, um, and the famous example that he used, which he took from John Stuart Mill, was the round square. John Mill thought it was an absurd idea that there's a round square. Meinung thought the round square is an object of thought. It's something we think about. It's an object of our discourse. It's contradictory. It can have no being. It doesn't exist or subsist. Nonetheless, he thinks that the round square is round. Um, and he's got a point, I suppose. I mean, it's not... Well, I was going to say it's not square, but it is square. It's not triangular. Right? So, so you might want to say, well, yeah, on the one hand, like Sherlock Holmes, even if he doesn't exist, Sherlock Holmes is a detective. He's a non-existent detective. Um, but he's a detective nonetheless. There are just some detectives who exist and some don't. If you take that view... Uh, and you know, then you could throw that back to me and say, well, didn't you just say that some things exist and some don't? So why can't we say some detectives exist and some don't? Um, some of the inhabitants of Baker Street exist and some don't. And I think the, the inclination to say that Sherlock Holmes is a detective, that he really is a detective, even if he doesn't exist, is comes from the thought, well, he, he's not... Sherlock Holmes isn't an aerobics instructor, or he's not a swimming pool attendant. You know, he's, there are many things he's not. And you're getting things right, in a certain sense, if you say that he's a detective. Um, anyway, Meinong, if you wrote a story where Sherlock Holmes and you attributed the property of being an aerobics instructor to Sherlock Holmes, then Meinong would say, well, there is an object of thought there that... that you've attributed being an aerobics instructor to, and that's you calling it Sherlock Holmes. So Meinock has a very liberal view. He just thinks all of these things have properties. And that's because he had what he called the, he thought of the, the independence of being from being so. This is what his principle of independence was called. The independence of being from being so. Whether or not something is so, whether or not something has a property, that is, is independent of whether it has being. That was his view. Um, so that's his view. None of these things exist or have being. I mean, I'm just putting those things together. But that does not stop them having properties. Now, there's, there's a great moment in Woody Allen's film, The Purple Rose of Cairo. Has anyone seen that film? Yeah. It's one of, the, one of the Woody Allen films that doesn't have Woody Allen in it, which is a point in its favour, I think. Uh, you know, sort of annoying little character that he is. He's not in that film. And it's, it's a very poignant story about, in the set in the Depression, where Mia Farrow plays a, a character who goes to the cinema every day to see the very same film. I think they can't afford to have another film, so they just keep playing the same film. And she falls in love with the character in the film, who's tremendously handsome and uh, charming and rich and everything um, and one day the character in the film looks out of the film and sees her sitting there and says oh you're sitting here again and, and jumps out of, the, out of the, the, the film and talks to her and falls in love with her and, and it's very funny actually. it's much funnier than the way I'm telling it um, then back in Hollywood they get worried because the actor who plays that character uh, is concerned you know, that his fame and payment is going to be diminished by the fact that his, his character has now run off with someone else uh, so they send the actor out to wherever Mia Farrow lives and she has to choose between and, and he falls in love with Mia Farrow too and she has to choose between the actor and the character and the character says Look at me, I'm handsome, I'm rich, I'm brilliant, I'm funny, I've got this beautiful house, blah, blah, blah. And the other guy says, yeah, but I'm real. <laughs> so the idea that you might have to choose between something that has all these properties but isn't real and something that has the properties that is, that is real <coughs> is uh, part, I think, of what's... It's indicative of what's rather peculiar about Meinong's view. That there are these things out there that have these properties... Even if they're not real, they don't have being, they don't exist. What does it really mean? So, um, those are the two views. And I'm, I'm going to go for a middle way. It might be rather unfashionable these days. I think um, in the LSE they used to be really keen on middle ways or third ways or something. I don't know whether they do that. Now, maybe they're going for fifth ways. Or, um, but 
I'm going to go for a third way, which is a middle way. The truth often lies between two extremes. The one extreme is the descartes malebranche view that says non-existent objects have no properties. The other is the Meinong view that they says they have all the properties they're represented as having. And my view is that non-existent objects have some of the properties attributed to them, but not all. Um, now that might sound like a really weedy compromise. It's like, you know, on the one hand you've got these really strong views that say, like, you know, Malebranche says, nothingness has no properties. On the other hand, Meinong says, being and being so are completely distinct. And then I come along in the middle and say, well, I mean, you know, a little bit of both, really. Just some of them do, some of them don't. Um, but, but this is a very principled view, and the, it relies on the idea that some attributions of properties to non-existent objects are actually incorrect. And I'm going to say, Sherlock Holmes isn't a detective. Vulcan isn't a planet. Um, and um, Pegasus isn't a horse, for example. And in this respect, attributions of properties to non-existing objects are just like attributions of properties to existing objects. Some of them are correct. We make mistakes about things. We attribute properties to things that they don't have. And we are ignorant of the properties of things that things do have. The important point is the point that we can be in error about this. Um, so this is going to be my view. I'm going to say some attributions of properties to non-existent objects are incorrect. Now the two key questions I'm going to answer are first, what does it mean for an object to have a property? So I'm going to answer that question first. And then I'm going to say, oh, this PowerPoint has called this question one as well. But in fact, that's question two. So what kinds of property do non-existent objects have? The first question is, what does it mean for an object to have a property? The second is, what kinds of property do these non-existent objects have? Um, you'll have noticed that I'm using the word object as well as thing. I'm saying things that don't exist, non-existent objects, those mean the same thing. So my first key question is, what does it mean for an object to have a property? Now, I've already said a little bit about properties. I said the word property, attribute, qualities, features... Um, the, I'm using all these words in the same way to talk about um, uh, not talk to talk about an individual an individual object, an individual person but to talk about their features like their height, their weight, their colour their attractiveness, their charm or whatever the general principle I'm going to appeal to is that whenever we say of that something that it is such and such, that it's a certain way, that it has a colour, a shape or size or something we're predicating a property of it. Um, predicating is a linguistic act. It's saying of something that it has a property. And so, for example, you know, if you're saying something is red, that red is the name of a property. It's a name for the property that we predicate of something when we say that it's red. Um, so when you, say off that, when you say that something is a certain way, then you're predicating a property of it. You're saying something is true of it. Um, now, in, in the philosophical discussion in the last um, 30 or 40 years or so, distinctions have been made between kinds of properties. And this is going to be very important for what I want to say. Um, there are properties that just correspond to, in, in a one-to-one -one way, with the kinds of words that we use to talk about them. What I mean by this is that you, know, you might say someone is tall. Um, so you might say that Sally is tall. You might say that she's five foot eight. You might say that she's five, over five foot seven. Um, you might say she's between six foot and five foot six or you might say she's 170 something centimeters these are all different ways of talking about a property that she has namely her height in this first way of thinking about properties these are all distinct properties so saying that someone's tall and saying that they're over five foot six or something uh, or saying that someone is Five, well, actually, it's better to say, say that someone is, some particular person, Sally, is 
five foot eleven, uh, and, or that she's five foot eleven and one quarter of an inch, or something. These are all distinct properties of things. Right? So, for every type of way of talking about something, there is a distinct type of property. Properties are, so to speak, just the shadows of the ways we talk. But there's another way of thinking where the properties of things are the things that we discover <coughs> about the world. And if the properties of things are the things that we discover about the world, then they can't just correspond simply to, in a one-to-one -one way, between the different um, ways we have of talking about those things. For example, if the property of being made of H2O molecules and the property of being water, it was a scientific discovery to discover that, roughly speaking, they're the same thing. The property of being gold, being made of gold, and the property of being made of the element with the atomic number 79, those are different ways of talking, but the same property. So it's natural to expect that we should be able to say this because we do the same with names. So, you know, two people can have, uh, one person can have two names. Um, one person can be referred to in many different ways. We can talk about many diff the same person in many different ways. Um, so similarly, we can do the same thing with properties. Uh, so we might say that this, um, this, uh, these seats are a particular shade of green. Um, and you can say that they're green. It's true to say they're green. It's also true to say that they are lime green, let's suppose. I don't know whether they're lime green. It's also true to say that they are green 257 or some very specific shade on the ultimate discriminable um, uh, color chart, the discriminable point in the color chart. Um, now, on one way of thinking of properties, those are all different properties on the first way. On the second way of thinking of properties, they could be all picking out the same property of this thing, namely the one colour that this chair, these chairs actually have. So there are different ways of thinking of properties. The first way is what the American philosopher called David Lewis called the abundant way of thinking about properties. This is there are as many properties as there are phrases to, to, to be used to talk about them. And then, uh, the second way is what Lewis called the sparse way. I'm, I'm going to use a different term. Just because uh, I, I don't like this term abundant and sparse but I just want to indicate for those who know that work of Lewis is that this is what I'm on about um, I'm going to use the word substantial the substantial properties of things for the second kind of thing that it's one of the substantial properties of gold that it is an element with uh, the atomic number 79 um, and then the non-substantial properties are all the other ones um, the ones that merely correspond to the different ways we have of talking about things. Now, I think these are two perfectly legitimate ways of talking about the properties of things. We just have to be clear about what, which, which one we're using. So that's the heart of what I'm going to say, um, this, this distinction between two kinds of properties. Non-substantial properties, there are many of them. This is why Lewis calls them abundant because you can talk about things and you can create complex uh, ways of talking about things by using logical words like or, for example. So here's a red apple. But it's true of this apple that it's red or green right? in a sort of annoying, boring way. It's red or green because it's red. Now, if something is red or green, then it's either red or it's green. Uh, so if that is true of something, it's true because it has one property, not this, what we might call this disjunctive property. So, non so being, being red or green is a non-substantial property. Uh, and the reason is that it doesn't tell you that much about the nature of something to say it's red or green. It tells you a little bit, but it doesn't tell you that much. Um, now, Meinong had a very good view. Uh, one of his views, a number of his views were very good. But it's, when I say good, I mean correct. I mean right. I mean the same as what I think. Um, and that was that the natures of things determine what they are. That things have natures. Um, 
And he said, this is a nice quote from a book, on, from a book about Mainong by Carol Lambert, where he said, what an object is, Lambert says, is a function solely of its nature. It's in virtue of their natures that camels have humps, the number one is prime, and, and this is the controversial bit, Mill's round square is round. So this is why Mainong said, being is independent from being so, because being, being so is the nature of something. When I tell you what the round square is, I tell you it's round and it's square. It doesn't have any being, but it's round and it's square. Um, but I think Meinung's right to say what an object is is a function of its nature. Um, and it's in virtue of their natures that camels have humps. And that the number one is prime. But I think he's wrong to say that Mill's round square is round. Because I don't think non-existent objects have any natures. The nature of something is its substantial properties things that tell you what kind of thing it is. But Vulcan, take Vulcan as an uncontroversial example of something that doesn't exist, Vulcan doesn't have any substantial properties. What is, if Vulcan were a planet, then it would have to have a certain mass or a certain weight, because all planets have mass and weight. That's what it is to be a planet. It's in the nature of the planet to be an object of a certain size Hence, you know, the, 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 the tragic demotion of Pluto from the status of planet, that it's now a planetoid or something, um, because it just wasn't big enough. It just didn't get there. It wasn't big enough. Um, now, if Vulcan was going to be a planet, it would have to be big enough. It would have to have size and shape. But, of course, Vulcan doesn't have a mass. And this is, you know, one of the things then where this connects, connect questions of error connect with questions of fiction, because... Um, if, if Sherlock Holmes is a man, even if he's a non-existent man, then the question is asked by philosophers, well, if he's a man, then there must be some determinate number of hairs on his head at any one point, because that's the way it is with men. They have a determinate number of hairs on their head at any one point. How many hairs did Sherlock Holmes have on his head? That's clearly a silly question that in, has nothing to do with the understanding of the Sherlock Holmes stories. You would not be entitled to sort of send the book back because it didn't tell you how many hairs Sherlock Holmes had on his head or to think that Benedict Cumberbatch was a bad representation of Sherlock Holmes because he had too much hair. Right? That's, not, that's just missing the point about the whole thing of what fiction is about. Um, however, with a real person, there is a fact of the matter about how many hairs they have at any one time. Uh, changes over time. But at any one time now, you know, we could count the numbers of hairs on your head. Um, so that's part of your nature as a, as a hairy being, that you have a, some sort of fixed number of hairs on your head. It's, it's part of your nature. Just as it's part of Vulca and the nature of a planet to have a certain mass, a size, it's part of the nature of a horse to be bred from other horses um, and to have the internal organs of a horse, for example, and for all these reasons, I'm now going to just assert, because um, I'm coming to my final sort of ten minutes, and I'm going to assert that Pegasus isn't a horse for that reason, because he doesn't have the nature of a horse. Pegasus is a mythical horse, but mythical horses aren't horses. Sherlock Holmes isn't a detective, because he never solved a crime in his life, or even tried to solve a crime in his life, because he didn't have a life. Um, Sherlock Holmes didn't live on Baker Street, if he lived on Baker Street, he would have had to have lived somewhere on Baker Street. But if you listed the inhabitants of Baker Street, since Baker Street came into existence, there will never have been a bit of space and time where Sherlock Holmes lived. Now, that's what it means to live on a street. That's, so to speak, the essence of living on a street, is that at some point you've lived in a house or something there. That's your address in the street. So I'm laboring the point. Sherlock Holmes didn't live in Baker Street. Of course, in the books, he lived in Baker Street. And that's a different claim. But he didn't live in Baker Street, and he wasn't a detective. So, against Meinong, I say that non-existent objects do not have substantial properties. They don't have natures in that sense. They have no nature. That's, that's my point against Meinong. So my point against Descartes and Malebranche is that there clearly are true predications of non-existent objects, and my point about, against um, Meinong is that non-existent objects have no substantial properties. So this is my 
that, sorry, this is my point against Descartes, do they have any properties at all? Some people will say, uh, will agree with Descartes, many contemporary philosophers and logicians agree with Descartes and say no, they don't have any properties at all. Um, but, when he, so this is, this is where I appeal to the obvious truths about the things I've said already, not the bits of philosophy I've said, but rather the facts, namely that Vulcan was hypothesized by Le Verrier in 1859 using the same method that he used to hypothesize Neptune in 1846. So I've said something of Vulcan. I've predicated being hypothesized by Le Verrier of Vulcan. Um, so I've said something true of him, and according to my definition of a property, the non-substantial idea of a property, I predicated a property of Vulcan. It's a non-substantial property of Vulcan. That is, something true of Vulcan. So that's against Descartes. Um, there are many more cases, of course. Um, a famous example from the philosoph philosophical literature on this, from Terence Parsons, is where uh, Sherlock Holmes is more famous than any living detective, which I think is true, actually. Um, for example, Sherlock Holmes is more famous than Sir Ian Blair, who was the, who was the head of the Metropolitan Police for some time. Um, being more famous, I mean, you know, more people have heard of Sherlock Holmes than have heard of Ian Blair. Um, and any other living detective you could care to mention, I think that's probably true. So there are true predications of non-existent objects. So Descartes is wrong. I say. Non existent objects have non substantial properties. Um, but this gives rise then to my final question, which is what kind of non substantial properties do they have? It's all very well to say they have some non substantial properties and not others, but unless I can give you a principle for saying when they do and when they don't, I'm just sort of um, listing things I think are true and things I think are false. So what I need is some sort of principle. Um, which will tell, tell you which kind of non-substantial non properties non-existent objects have. You see, because there are many kinds of non-substantial properties, but no non-existent apple is red or green, because I told you, in order to be red or green, you have to either be red or be green. But no um, non-existent object is red, and no non-existent object is green. So what principle can we use to say which non-substantial properties non-existent objects have? Um, here I then find myself in agreement with something Bertrand Russell said, um, maybe because he said so many things about this subject and they were all in conflict with each other that in the end you have to agree with some of the things he said. And there's a nice comment that he made about the difference between Napoleon and Hamlet. Um, when in his introduction to mathematical philosophy he said that when you've taken account of all the feelings roused by Napoleon in writers and readers of history you've not touched the actual man but in the case of Hamlet you have come to the end of him if no one thought about Hamlet there would be nothing left of him if no one had thought about Napoleon he would have soon seen to it that someone did uh, now he's right so that's all there is to Hamlet it's just what people are thinking about Hamlet or the representations of Hamlet. That's not all there is to Napoleon. Now listen, Napoleon and Hamlet are both fictional characters, but Napoleon's a bit more than a fictional character too. He's an existing person. So the answer to my question then is that non-existent objects have only those non-substantial properties which result from those objects being represented in some way. Um, that's a bit of a convoluted way of putting it. I'm going to use the phrase, but let me give you some examples. Um, being postulated by Le Verrier is a property of, of, um, of Vulcan. Being a mythical horse is a, is a property of Pegasus, I say. Um, having a horn is not a property of a, a unicorn, but being represented as having a horn is. Being famous, I think, it's a property that you can only have if you're represented in a certain way. You can only be famous if people are representing you, talking about you, writing about you, thinking about you. That's what it is to be famous, is to be well known. Lots of people know about you. Um, and maybe I say even non-existence itself. So when you say, when I say Vulcan is non-existent, that fact does not depend on 
the fact that Vulcan is non-existent does not depend on the, the fact that Vulcan's represented. But Vulcan's only a non-existent planet because someone proposed that it was a planet. If you don't say that, then you have to have this image that there are all these kind of non-existent objects out there waiting for us to talk about them, right? which is just uh, a bizarre way to think that things are. So I think even non-existence itself is a property that depends or results from the representation of objects in thought and language. And I'm going to call these properties representation-dependent properties. I know I've introduced lots of terms for properties, and I apologize for that, but um, this, this is the key term, a representation-dependent property. A representation-dependent property is a property that something has because it is represented in a certain way. And I borrow this term from a nice book by Colin McGinn called Logical Properties. Um, so, there are representation-dependent properties and non-existent objects have them. So, therefore, also there are non-representation-dependent properties, which are properties that don't re reside in or derive from the fact that something is represented in a certain way. Being a horse, for example, Things aren't horses because they're represented as such. Uh, something isn't gold because it's represented as such. <clears throat> you are not a person because you're represented as, as such by someone somewhere else. You have a nature, and it's part of your nature to be a person. The properties, I say, these are properties that things can have independently of whether they're represented in some way. So I say, being, being a horse, being red or green, being red, being a detective, Living on Baker Street is a non-representation dependent property, arguably. That's bit... That example is a little bit fiddly, but the basic idea is that whether or not you live on Baker Street does not depend on any, whether anyone represents you as living on Baker Street. Now, notice that some of these properties are substantial in my previous sense and some are not, so this isn't quite the same distinction. Representation dependent properties are a subset of the non-substantial properties. Um, so this brings me to then my final point which is the difference between existing things and non-existing things um, I say the difference lies in the kinds of properties that they have existing things can have substantial and non-substantial properties so you, existing things can have all those properties like being red or green <coughs> being 50 miles from Baltimore and all these properties as well as properties like having the atomic number 79 and all these substantial properties. Um, but they can also have representation-dependent properties. So existing things can be famous, of course. You know, so, um, the most famous people in the world exist. Um, like Madonna must be one of the most famous people in the world, I think. Um, or the Queen. These are famous people. They exist. Fame is a representation-dependent property. So existing things can have representation-dependent properties. But my point is that non-existing things can only have representation-dependent properties. And that's my way of spelling out the insight from Russell's remark about Hamlet and Napoleon. <coughs> to learn more about this subject, I now turn to my sponsor, <laughs> Oxford University Press, for uh, this book, The Objects of Thought, um, which... I recommend to you it's 177 pages long and it only has three footnotes and it will give you more of the answers to this way of understanding. But let me say finally why this is a significant subject. This isn't just a word game or puzzle. Um, in this book I defend a conception of the mind which says that mental representation or what philosophers have called intentionality is the essential feature of mental activity. Now, Mental representation involves representing things that exist and things that don't exist. The philo philosophical theories of the mind have had tremendous trouble explaining how you can have this thing which represents <coughs> things that exist and things that don't exist. Um, and my view is that unless you understand the idea of things that don't exist and the representation of things that don't exist, then you won't understand the nature of the mind. And that's why this subject is significant. So, thank you very much.
I'm sure you've all got lots of questions. I would ask if you can be as concise as possible when you're asking a question, so as many people as possible can get a chance to speak. Okay, I just would like an explanation. Uh, how do you make the difference between error and uh, fictions? Yeah, that's the major question. The question, could you hear the question in the back? The question was, how, how do I make the distinction between error and fiction, which I drew this? Um, I, it's not a sharp distinction, I think. It's one with blurred boundaries. So things could and probably have begun as error um, and ended up as fiction. I mean, you could think of the Greek myths like that. So I don't know whether the ancient Greeks really believed in their gods, but if they did... They started off by believing in them, and you know, if they really did think that Zeus lived at the top of Mount Olympus, then they were in error. Um, then, as time went on, you know, we tell these myths to children, and you tell them as fiction. Um, so, myth is then a category that um, well, myth can mean many things here, but but um, that those kind of myths could be things that started out as error and turned into fiction. Because fictions may have a heuristic value. I mean, uh, sure, yeah, so that's true. But they are as well. Um, yes, I mean, I said nothing here about, no, no. What, about the meaning of fiction and the point of fiction. Because fiction has, um, has all sorts of value, which doesn't depend on the fictional characters existing uh, and doesn't depend on being based on error in any way. So. Sorry, just it's this gentleman in the oh, front okay. well, and then you next. Yeah. Thanks very much. So, um, you're quite quick at one stage to move on the kind of Descartes Marvel view that nothingness has no properties mm, mm. to um, no existing things have no properties. Yeah. Well, that was a, bit, a little bit quick. Yeah. Uh, might, that first phrase might have been used in the sense of which we use it when we say, you know, why is there something rather than nothing? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So if there's in, in, when there's nothing at all, yeah. there aren't in, even any representations. Yeah. So what would you yeah. say about that case where it's a representation-free universe, as it were? Yeah. Are there still properties that are... Why don't you even defend the idea that it doesn't have any properties? Um... Yeah, it's a good question. Did you hear the question or not? No. no. So the, the, the question was um, that I said, I described the Descartes Malebranche view as nothingness has no properties. And then I went on to talk about non existent objects not having properties. And the, the, the question is making the point that actually, when you're talking about nothingness, you might be talking about something else, not non existent objects, but the complete absence of anything, as when you, as when you say, why is there something rather than nothing? Or did the universe come out of nothing? Or nothingness? Or could there have been nothing? There's a question. Um, now, so I, I think when we speculate about nothingness, we say nothingness is metaphysically possible or something. This is what people say. That it, in the sense, it could, it could have been, there could have been nothing. The world could have just failed to get its act together and not got up in the morning. Nothing. There was nothingness. Just and, um, then I think that nothingness has the representation-dependent property of being metaphysically possible because we've represented it in that way. And if it is, if, um, or rather, I mean, oh, sorry, it has it has the rep- representation-dependent property of being represented as metaphysically possible, not. Whether it is metaphysically possible is another question. In fact, it's impossible, impossible to answer. But so I think it, I think merely by thinking about it is enough to give nothingness some properties. Um, but you're absolutely right. Concern about nothingness is different from non-existent objects, and I just blurred that whole thing. Yeah. Has your um, uh, substantial and non-substantial properties? Anything to do with uh, defining an uh, incident of properties? Or is there a difference? Um, defining and incident. incidental. Where by incidental, you mean things that think properties things just happen to have or something like that? You, you are a philosopher. Yeah. Maybe 
uh, you will define the property because whereas you are right. wearing a white shirt, right. it's an incidental property. Right. And I got the impression that right. your substantial and non substantial has something to do with this. I don't That's a bit, it is something in that ballpark, yeah. I hadn't thought about incidental. Um, because another idea is accidental. People in the medieval philosophers used to talk about accidents or accidental properties. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't want to use the word defining because defining has the connotation of um, being related to, to words and their meanings. So I'd rather talk about the natures of things which may not be recoverable from thinking about words and their meanings. But it's a similar kind of distinction. Yeah. Well, I just mentioned this because I got it from uh, uh, an American philosopher called Hostel. John Hospice. That's right. Mm. The brilliant book, and uh -huh. that was published yeah. in 1987. Right. Or 1970. And, uh, I think it went through many editions. Yeah. Very famous book, yeah. yeah. No, that was the last edition, 1970. Yeah. Okay. And, um, uh, so it is a kind of a, a, a question that has been revolving around. Yeah. It's a similar thing, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. It goes back to questions of essence versus accident and those things as well. But, but, uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, I have two quick, quick questions, I guess. Uh, one is uh, would you say that, that, that you can say what you said without uh, realist or essentialist uh, assumptions? Would you agree that, that they are necessary for, for saying what you said? And the, the second is uh, when you mentioned that you believe that Jesus Christ um, existed, for instance. Obviously, this yeah. is not obvious, uh, isn't it? Uh, that, uh, so I wonder whether the existence is not, in this case, in, 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 case, in the case of your theory, predicated upon further inquiry, kind of historical inquiry. Because how do we know which of the properties are uh, substantial, which are not? Um, yeah, well, that's the great question. How do we know which properties are substantial and which are not? How do we know which things exist and which things are not? I, yeah, I didn't touch on that question at all. Um, in the case of Jesus, there's a lot of evidence that he existed. Um, in, uh, outside the Bible, there's evidence from Tacitus and Josephus and these, the Roman and Jewish historians. So there is evidence. But, so you rely on evidence for, but, uh, for some things. For other things, you don't rely on evidence. But I don't have anything really interesting to say about how we know things exist. I mean, your first question was, uh, does this answer rely on realist or essentialist assumptions? I, I think in some sense of realist, it relies on a realist assumption, which is um, existing things, what am I say about existing things? Yeah, th have properties independently of whether they're represented in some way. Yeah, so, so somehow thing, there are things out there, they have properties, and we find out about them. Yeah, that's, that much realism is involved, um, which is also compatible with certain kinds of idealism, I think. But um, the other question was about essentialism. I don't think it's committed to any interesting kind of essentialism. I say things have natures. So objects have natures. <coughs> so, you know, a horse has a nature, has the nature of a horse. That's found out kind of empirically and uh, other things, the natures of other things are found out in other ways. So. Um, I don't, I didn't, I tried not to use the word essence, but so I, I tried to do without that if I could. But you agree that it would be difficult to talk about without, uh, I mean, in not nominalist terms, for instance. It would be very difficult to talk about it. Yeah. You, you agree with, with in in nominalist in what sense? Well, nominalist I would say, not, not realist. Uh, what do you, because the word's used in many ways, so I'm not sure what do you, um, do you mean that there are no, there are no properties or something, or, or that there are no, well, or that, that, that there are properties, but they, they fulfill a different role than in, in the realist uh, framework, let's say. You see, I don't think my view relies on any particular conception of properties, except that things can have them, whether or not their representatives <coughs> have them, so whatever the properties are. Uh, then I think they could they could take my view. I think. Between Descartes and Meinhof, there is, of course, Kant. Yes. I wondered how your view plays out with 
his account of representation in itself. Oh. That's an incredibly difficult question. <laughs> you can't possibly expect me to answer that question at this moment. Um, uh, well, there are two, I, th I suppose just two things in Kant is, is, are relevant. One, one is big and one is small. Um, the big thing is that Kant thought that things in themselves were things we couldn't know or the thing in itself was something that we couldn't really know and that we only knew appearances. We only know appearances in a certain sense. And that's, a, that's relevant because, coming back to this gentleman's question, because um, this is part of his idealist conception of the world, that in some sense, how things are for us in experience is a contribution <coughs> of the things and our minds too, so that our minds and our things get together and produce the world. Uh, and that's his I idealism. Um, and that is clearly relevant to what I'm, I'm saying because I'm assuming a very simple idea that things have properties independently of being represented as so. Um, now, Kant's view of representation was, was much more complicated. Um, and I think probably Kant couldn't agree with what I'm saying here. But then he's dead, so he doesn't get this. <laughs> he doesn't get a chance. Uh, the, the thing that's mi the minor thing is when Kant said exist existence is not a real predicate. That was some something that had been taken up in many discussions, um, and I think that's not an important question. Yeah. Sorry. But there is some implied or argument a similar division between that which we have to assume but can't know and that which is represented. That's true. Yeah, that's that's true. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah that's a good point. Yeah. Um, yeah. I could ramble on at this point, but I think uh, I'm not sure if it would be of mutual benefit. But uh, but that's a very good point. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think my question was just answered. It was an observation from an amateur point of view that you never use the idea. You, you never use the word idea. Right. You were talking at right. All. But I think it was because of that point that you wanted to kind of avoid something yeah. about the idea of something rather than an object. Actually, no, not, not really, actually. I mean, I'd be perfectly happy to use the word idea rather than representation. Um, it's just I use, because I think there are, there are ideas, and ideas are representations. Um, so, in that sense, I agree with Kant when Kant talks about representations. I mean, the word he uses is often translated into the English word idea, and it's sometimes translated as representation. Um, so well, ideas I, have the same properties as you were talking about there? Um, no, because when I talked about I was talking about representation to include linguistic representations as well, so saying something of something, as well as thinking something of something. So I was being more general there. Um, so I wouldn't want to agree with Kant's conception of representation. But nonetheless, I think he's on the right lines. That the, that's what the mind does. The mind is a representing thing. Um. Hi, yeah, sorry. Um, sort of on the basic question, I'm not from philosophy. So, can a thing be existing, given, given the fixed time, can a thing be existing and then transgress? to non-existing and then back again or vice versa. Yeah. This is a, uh, well, I don't know, a vice versa, I'm not sure. So basically, can it, um, can it, can it go <laughs> to non-existing and vice versa? No. So can it like, travel between existing and non-existing? No. But things can go out of existence. Uh, uh, this is a problem for my view. So I wish you hadn't asked this question. <laughs> existence in... Some people think of existence as being in essentially temporal, so that things, things like you know, Kant and Napoleon, people like that, and your ancestors in the past, who no, they no longer exist, um, they just, they're just as non-existent as Pegasus and the round square and Vulcan. Uh, I don't agree with that, so I think they've got more reality, but it's true that they no longer exist. Um, no, so I do think things that you have to make sense of the idea of things going out of existence things no longer exist 
Um, the short, I don't think things can come back into existence once they've gone out of existence. So that would be like. Um, Uh, but I can't, expl- I can't really explain that now. Uh, but the, the, the problem with time for me is that I have to commit myself to the view that all times exist equally, um, which is the sort of what's called the four-dimensional view of space-time. So, which some people say, well, that's the right view. That's the view that physics has. But I don't really want my theory to be committed to that view, whether or not it's true. Um, but I just accept it. Gentlemen in the start talk, and then the guy in front of him. Um, I was wondering if uh, you can talk about that. If you have a stance on, on, on values, if values uh, are representative dependent or, or are properties or not, how do you think about, think about that? Yeah, that's a very, that, very, you see, yeah, that's a very difficult question. The course is beautiful, the course is good. It's yeah. not a representation in the same sense that, that yeah. you talk about red or green. So I think there are values and that things have value and things have value because of the properties that they have. Um, and so your question is, what are these properties that are <coughs> dependent yeah, on our representation? Values, uh, in your view, are, are, are representations and yeah. substantial or not substantial? I think there, are, there may be different kinds of value here. So there may be some of the properties that give rise to value might be non-representation dependent things. I mean, if you think... You know, the aesthetic properties of an object might just be the aesthetic properties of a landscape, say. You know, they're not dependent on being represented in any way. They're just, some of them are just there. And then some of them aren't. So some of them are things that the attractiveness of a person seems to be representation dependent in the sense that uh, talking about a certain... This, there are things about that person that make... that, that attract people or... I don't have anything very um, enlightening to say on that. It's an interesting question, but my inclination would be to say it's a bit of both and with value. Value is such a broad category. Um, I mean, here's one question, just coming back to the earlier question in the front. You know, would there be any value if there'd never been any human beings? Would there be any things of value? Would anything be valuable if there were no human beings? That's a very difficult question. You want to say yes and no, in a way. <laughs> which, is, which is why it's difficult. <laughs> Surely the um, existence of fame also means that the existence of Sherlock Holmes. Because um, if the author of Sherlock Holmes was just saying, this person here, he lived in Baker Streets, he sold crimes, and uh, therefore and anyone who surely is that, then is Sherlock Holmes. Because you need to say fame is when this person is known by lots of people and this and this. So whoever is that is famous. So surely Sherlock Holmes does exist and just as the fame does exist. Um, I don't think I agree with that. <laughs> it sounded very good when you said it. <laughs> um, so Sherlock Holmes gets to be famous because people read these books about him. So we'd agree with that. How does he get to exist because someone decides to write a story about him? I'm not saying he exists because someone writes a story about him. I'm saying he exists because there is a definition of him. Because so maybe, right. yeah, just like there is a definition of fame, so Sherlock right. Holmes is this person. If you are mm. um, that person, then you are Sherlock Holmes. Just like, um, yeah, but no one is that person. That's the but, but if you, um, let's take chocolate for an example. Chocolate? Chocolate, yeah. yeah. You, have, you can have a chocolate bar, and yeah. it's made of certain things, yeah. and you say, this is chocolate. And um, you can put different brands in it or anything, but mm-hmm. it's still chocolate. If you make something just like that, then it is going to be chocolate. Yeah, that's because it has the nature of chocolate. I see. Yeah. So if Sherlock Holmes is going to be... So the question is, what sort of thing is Sherlock Holmes if he does exist? And those who think Sherlock Holmes, ex- so those who think Sherlock Holmes does exist, um, and they're serious, of, those people are serious about this, they think Sherlock Holmes isn't a person. So it's not like chocolate. Um, it's just 
Sherlock isn't a person. What he is is a feature of the story, and what they call an abstract entity. He's an abstract entity that was created by the author. So I don't think you can define people into existence. Maybe you can define abstract entities into existence, and some people think that. Um. Going back to the question raised by the man in front of me about things going from non-existence to existence. Yeah. Another philosopher, but I seem to remember reading about European philosophers using the black swan as an, inst an instance of things that don't exist until they were discovered in Australia. Yeah. Is that, in some sense, a non-existent object coming from existing? Uh, <laughs> no, I don't think so. No, it's, it's a case of error about what it is. Yeah. Uh, can an abstract entity ever become a representation-dependent property. So where, is there ever an overlap between, say, you said, for example, uh, a non-existent, oh, sorry, yeah, a non-existent object doesn't have incorrect attributions, but when... It do, they do, I think, yeah, so you can, you, you, you can, because you can say the round square is round, and it's not round. No, but I mean, yeah. can you turn an attribution into a representation-dependent property if you say it enough times? If you, you know. uh, yeah, I mean, in effect, that's what you do when you... I mean, the, the property you get... So Sherlock Holmes is attributed um, the property of smoking a pipe, or rather he's represented as smoking a pipe. And the way that that got to be true is that Doyle represented him as smoking a pipe many times. So he'd write the story. That's what the author can do. Right? So, and similarly with Le Verrier, you know, in the case of error, Vulcan is represented as lying between Mercury and the Sun. Um, so that's an attribution to Vulcan of its position in space being represented as lying between Mercury and the Sun. So that... that so you can create a representation-dependent property by attributing something. That's, I suppose that's, that's what I want to say. Yeah, that's right. Hi. Um, I was asked about non-existent objects which have been, weren't represented. Mm. So <coughs> mm. I kind of wanted to, to something you said is that non-existent objects only have those non-substantial properties which result from them. Yeah. Representative. Yeah. But presumably, if it's never representative, it has no, no properties. Of yeah. Cool. Yeah. So I was That's wondering right. if you thought there could be such things as non-existent objects in that way, which is one we haven't before. Uh, I want to say no, but then you might say back to me, well, couldn't there be a non-existent object that no one had ever thought of? And I say, well, uh, no. But I've just told you. There it is. I've thought of it. It's the non-existent object no one's ever thought of. So it has that property of being such, being represented as being such that no one ever thought of. Um, now, that, that is like you know, Barclay's famous argument about you, can't con you cannot conceive of an, un of, you know, of an unconceived tree. Because once you start to conceive of an unconceived tree, you've already conceived of it, so it's already there. You've already got. And I think that that's... Okay, in that sense, a non, you, you could have a non-existent object that no one's ever thought of because you re, re, it can have the representational dependent property of being <coughs> such that no one's ever thought of it. Or, sorry, represented as such that no one's ever thought of it. But what you can't have is... the there just aren't any objects out there for us to discover. So no non-existent objects are discovered. Um, whereas that's the difference with existing objects. So, so I was kind of thinking of maybe in a less mystical case than the non-existent objects which you know, thought of. Yeah. Had the world been some other way than it actually is, yeah. I could have thought of an object that I in fact don't think of. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and the question is, how things actually, how things actually are. Yeah. Is there such an object which I could have thought about? Do. I think I want to say the same thing. I want to say that the thing, these things enter the discourse when you're talking about the possibilities. And of course, and since that possibility is true, and you've represented some 
something as having some modal property being the one that you could have thought of. Um, that's all. And, that's, and since none of those possibilities really exist, I mean, they exist, but they only exist in the way that possibilities exist, and they're not, they're not real, then um, these are non-existent. Just one final question, I think, from the front. Please. To get back to what that one gentleman was talking about, going in and out of existence, mm. If you believed in the block universe, mm. as apparently Einstein did, it wouldn't it be true to say that nothing goes out of existence? Would you agree with that? Um, yes. I mean, in a certain... If existence is not... If existence is not temporal, but rather existence is just... is having some... Uh, occupying some <coughs> space in the four-dimensional space-time then nothing goes out of existence, that's true. Because going out of existence implies the idea of the flow of time or passage or you know, early, the, not just earlier and later, but past, present and future. So it's something that did exist, but it doesn't anymore. And if that way, that way of talking in terms of time, is that, if that's not the fundamental reality of time, then nothing, strictly speaking, goes in and out of existence. However... You know, we can say, you know, that the city of uh, some, some ancient, the city of Troy, you know, went out of existence. I mean, I can say that, or that uh, ceased to exist. Carthage was ceased to exist, or something. I mean, and, and we know what that means. You just have to translate it into the into the block universe terminology. Um, so just a question following on that. What about quantum theory then? When I, I don't understand quantum theory, but the idea was... You're not alone there. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, this is... Quantum theory, when you, think, yeah. when you look at something, when you try to interact yeah. with that particle, it changes its properties. Yeah. I think, I think that's a very controversial interpretation of, of the quantum theory, yeah, but... but um, um, it, it, it implies a kind of dependence of how things are at the smallest level of, of reality on our acts of measurement. And that kind of thing is a, it, a kind of violation of the realism I was assuming that this gentleman brought up in this question. So it's, it's a kind of idealism. The world is kind of mind-dependent in that way. Um, but but I, I think that can't be the truth about quantum theory. <laughs> Unfortunately, we've run out of time. Um, so I'd like to thank you all for coming and invite you to thank, thank the you very much. again.